extraordinary time in the field of the biology of aging. Um, the past decade or two have seen really almost unimaginable advances in our understanding of how cells and tissues age and how interventions like diet or, or drugs or parabiosis or other ways may actually slow the process of aging and even reverse the process of aging. Things that were considered unimaginable a few decades ago have become kind of part of the mainstream discussion of the biology of aging. <clears throat> so it really raises the question of what lies ahead in the coming decade, in the coming century. And today we have the privilege of having leading scientists worldwide here to, to address these kinds of questions and to um, address the topic of this session, which is, can science alter the course of human aging, the prospect of negligible senescence? So please welcome our guest, Dr. Stephen Austad. So Steve Austad is professor and chair of the Department of Biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. His current research seeks to understand the underlying causes of aging with a long-term goal of developing medical interventions to slow the age-related decay of human health. He's particularly notable for his research on species of exceptional longevity, including a marine mollusk that lives for over 500 years. Steve is an author of more than 180 scientific papers covering really nearly every aspect of aging from cells to societies. Um, he's a recipient, recipient of innumerable awards, including the Nathan Schock Center Award from the National Institute on Aging, the Irving Wright Award from the American Federation for Aging Research, and the Ibsen Foundation Longevity Prize. Uh, thank you, and it's an honor to be here. And I'd like to talk about the future of human longevity, but sometimes to think about the future, it helps to consider the past. So let's go back about 350 years to examine what our past for thousands of years has been like. And take the example of Thomas or Samuel Pepys, who was the most famous diarist of England. Now he was the most famous diarist not only because of his acute ability to observe daily life around him, but also because he lived in exceptionally interesting times. He came of age uh, during the English Civil Wars. As a teenager, he stood in the crowd. As King Charles I was executed. 11 years later, when Charles' son was restored to the throne, he was a government official. He lived through the great plague that killed 25% of all people in London and the great fire that followed it. Now what I'd like to do is use Pepys because we know so much about him as a, as a lens on what life was like from the time that cities and towns uh, came about until the very recent future. Now Pepys lived to 70 years old, which is a ripe old age for the 17th century. He had a family of 10 siblings. Um, he was the fifth, and if you'll see, each of the siblings here, this is the age at which they died. And by the time that Pepys was 10 years old, he was the oldest among his siblings. And he subsequently had another six siblings, and this is the age at which those siblings died. And you could see that life in this time was, very, was hazardous. It was transitory. Now, if you read about what killed his various siblings. It was very simple. It was all acute infections. Everything would be fine. They'd catch a fever, and a few days or weeks, or at most a few months later, they would be gone. The only one in the family to really live what we could think of as a normal life today was Pepys, and he's also the only one that developed chronic health problems as he got older. And in fact, for the last couple of years of his life, he was unable to really leave his home. So that's kind of a baseline of the long-term uh, uh, longevity that people could expect up until basically the middle of the 19th century. Now, oh, by the way, his wife, died at age 29. It was a typical thing. They were on a returning from a vacation in France. She got um, uh, a fever, and she came home two weeks later. She had died uh, 
I won't say she died despite the medical treatment she got, but possibly as many people did because of the medical treatment that she got in those days. Now, jump ahead a few years. Uh, I've got the data here for Sweden only because Sweden has the longest reliable data on life expectancy. And you can see that by a century after Peeps had died, we were starting to make remarkable progress, living longer and longer and longer. And since about the middle of the 19th century, life expectancy has been very steadily advancing, thanks to mostly to advances in public health and more recently in medicine. Now, this, this is a good thing in many ways, but it's not a good thing in all ways, because we're now living longer and healthier lives than we have in the 300,000 year history of our species. Our lives have been increasing by roughly six hours a day for over 150 years. That's quite remarkable. But a corollary of that, we're also living more unhealthy years than we've ever lived in human history. And so there's been a benefit, but there's also been a cost. We've been hoist by our own petard. We've been so successful at delaying death. One of the things we have not been successful at, mainly because until recently we hadn't been attempting it, is in delaying or slowing aging. Now, aging is now the number one threat to human health globally. Every place except sub-Saharan Africa, it's the diseases of aging that are really cause our illness, our disability, and our death. And for those of us who study aging in the field, the key thing is that if we can find ways to actually slow the underlying process, then that would allow us to delay and ameliorate all of these diseases as a group rather than one at a time. Now, why haven't we already done this? Why hasn't this been the goal of medical research for a very long time? I think part of it is that the structure of medical research has not been uh, receptive to it. This is pretty much the way that medical research is structured and the way that medical specialties are structured. It's structured by disease and by organ. And for the longest time, that was good enough. We've made tremendous progress at addressing many and many of these diseases. But now that we live as long as we do, knocking down these diseases one at a time is, is almost a fool's error. And what we really need to do is knock them all back at the same time. It's like an old car. Once things start going wrong, if you fix the door, then the lights don't work. If you fix the lights, then the, then the fuel injector doesn't work. And also what's happened in recent years is we've come to appreciate as people in these various specialties begin to talk to one another that really the process that underlies almost all of them is the process of aging. Now aging isn't magic. It's a physical process and like other physical processes, we can understand it and we can potentially by understanding it, do something to treat it. And in fact, we do even right now understand a tremendous amount about aging. And we understand so much that, that we're really on the verge of a huge revolution in medicine. Now, I'm not claiming, and I don't think, that we're gonna be living 500 years anytime soon. But I think enough evidence has accumulated from dozens and dozens and dozens of studies with experimental animals that an extra 10 to 20 years of healthy life is right here, right now, within our grasp. And I say that because we already have people that do these things. We have Fauja Singh, for instance, on the left there, who, who ran his first marathon at the age of 89 broke the old record of the marathon for people over 90 at the age of 93 by almost an hour, and ran his last marathon at the age of 101, at which point he retired. So unless, <laughs> unless he comes back and he's now 106 and he doesn't make any signs that he's coming back, 
That's absolutely remarkable. Uh, for years, I kept, I kept documentation on people that had various master athletic achievements, and I thought, no one will ever have a record for the best marathon by a 100-year-old. And then there's Irving Kahn on the right there, who ran his own investment firm to the age of 109. Now, Irving uh, was remarkable uh, in many ways. One, uh, one, of, <laughs> one of them is he had three siblings, and he wasn't even the longest lived of his siblings. He had a sister that lived almost a year longer than he did. But those people show us what's possible. And what we're after is to allow many or most of us to live the, as long and as healthy a lives as the things and the cons of the world. Now, in 2009, a paper appeared in Nature that a drug had made mice live longer. It was the first drug that really had robustly made mice live longer. And, and as you can see here, it got lots and lots of publicity. The thing is, it got the publicity for the wrong reason. And even the authors of the paper really didn't get what the most important thing about this paper was. The most important thing about this study was that the drug was started when these animals, when these mice were the equivalent of 60 years old. And subsequent study with the same drug has shown a powerful effect on longevity of animals even older, the human equivalent of 70 to 75 years old. And this was earth shaking. What this means is if these, if if things, if treatments, if interventions in the aging process can be started this late in life, not only is there hope for most of us in this room, but the other point is that it suddenly becomes possible to do human clinical trials on interventions that actually affect aging. You don't have to start it when the people are 30 and follow everybody for 50 years. And this means that it's possible to actually sort out the things that work from the things that don't. Because as many of you know, a lot of things that work in mice turn out not to work uh, in people. So we now have a promise of many, many interventions. Since that first paper came out, first of all, it didn't just affect longevity. It affected cognitive performance, it affected strength, mobility, immune function, all sorts of things. There have been dozens and dozens and dozens of follow-ups. But that really just opened the door. That was a watershed, and after that, the water poured through. And we now have really dozens of candidates, not just drugs, but something in the substance of blood from young individuals. We have new ways, new exercise regimes. There are emerging diets that seem to hold a lot of promise. So it seems to me that moving forward, the, the, the critical thing is not, the critical question has really nothing to do with whether we're going to be able to find ways for people to live an extra 10 to 20 years of excellent health. The question is going to be, what are we gonna do with those years of health? And I think that's a very open question and something that the Longevity Center is very well designed to address. Here's one really boring answer. We're gonna do the same thing, we'll just do it longer. You know, we'll work longer, uh, we'll have a longer retirement. That is really boring. I think we ought to think about changing the trajectory of human life. Now there is a trajectory of human life, but it's different now than it was 100 years ago. 100 years ago, this pretty much encapsulated here. People worked from as soon as they were able to us until they no longer could, both men and women. So what's happened? In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we invented two whole new phases of life. We invented childhood, work-free childhood, and we invented this other weird stage of life called retirement. Now it's time to rethink that trajectory I think you could summarize it as childhood, school, family, kids, career, retirement. That's kind of the standard uh, uh, trajectory of life. It's not what all of us have lived. And I already hear from what I've heard today that many people in this room, it's no longer that. But it's time to rethink that. Here's a possibility. What about 
childhood, school, family, kids, career, retraining, new career, public service. That's just one possibility. There are many, many possibilities that you can think about what we would do with these extra years. Notice when I enumerated that different trajectory, though, I didn't mention retirement. I think it might be time to rethink retirement, maybe rename retirement, maybe retire the whole concept of retirement and call it something there. I mean, we know now that people are happiest when they have a sense of purpose, when they have a reason to get up in the morning that transcends simple, aimless leisure. And we know that one of the most satisfying things in life is helping other people. So as we move forward, I think we ought to really think about what to do with those years. Here's the standard trajectory summarized. Here's where I think we could be going, where people would think of their later years as a time to pass things along. After all, this retraining that we'll be going through is going to be necessary. Technology is changing rapidly. There are some fields that are disappearing as we speak, like being able to drive people around in a vehicle. That's pretty much gone. It's like being a coal miner. In 10 years, it will be a profession that either no longer exists or is done by machines. So as we stand here, we're on the dawn of a real new era in health. And I think that what we need to do is to think seriously about what we want to do in this new dawn. Our ancestors, 100 years ago, couldn't possibly have understood that by now we would be living 30 years longer than they did, mostly healthy years. But we can foresee that as the 21st century progresses, our health will get better and better We'll live longer and longer, and it's going to be up to us to make the most of that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.